morning. Good morning. Phyllis asked me Wednesday at prayer meeting if I would lead the music and stuff. I couldn't think of anything fast enough besides to say besides yes. So, but I'm happy to be here. But um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Lord, your name is glorious and wonderful. Everyone on earth and heaven sing about your wondrous works. You are the king of all, and we worship you, our Lord. We gather in your presence in the unity of our faith to ask that you bless us. Without your power and grace, we can do nothing. We pray that your glory continues to feel and radiate within our lives so that we can be your ambassadors to the world. Let none of us leave here today empty-handed. Go with us into the world as we serve you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, and now let's go to our call to worship, hymn number three. Um, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. It's brought to you brought to us from Revelations 4, verse 11. Please stand as we sing, Worthy of Worship. good. Good morning. Um, I am doing some announcements today because uh, Phyllis knows how to ask uh, for forgiveness instead of permission. So it's all right. Um, first of all, I want to talk about Wednesday night. Wednesday night prayer, we want to thank Tim Waddell and uh, Larry and Helen Waddell and David Small for providing the meal. And it was absolutely delicious. For those of you who missed it, it was a good treat. You guys are, you're lucky, Helen to have these guys cooking for you. Um, also Wednesday night, Woody uh, and the company he works for, DSL, gave away, he had a coat giveaway. We also had some coats that uh, were given by some of our church family. Uh, I think um, Miss Annie Catherine and um, Evelyn Waddell brought some coats. And Woody brought 450 coats. And uh, if they were retail, they'd be about $9,000. Uh, it cost about $4,000 uh, for his company. So um, that was a big deal. And the coats went to uh, anyone who needs a coat. And this Wednesday night, we're going to do it again. 
So it's not if you have 17 coats in your closet with all the tags on it, okay? These are brand new coats. They're just last year's style. And, uh, but we're, he's gonna bring some more. So if you know anyone in your community, uh, anyone outside the community who needs a winter coat, there are windbreakers, raincoats, uh, fleecy things, please come and pick up a coat. It's a great ministry. And thank you to Woody and DSL for that. Also, we wanna ask that you remember the pastor search committee. Uh, that's Jeff Axelberg, John Kugel, Kellen Foley, Jeff Green, and Connie Mears as they do their work for the church. If you look on the back of your bulletin, you'll see the announcements. I'll go over those quickly. Um, we do have a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, February 5th. Uh, Churchwide visitation on the 6th if you'd like to join at 1 o'clock. Uh, there's a deacons meeting on February 9th, 4 p.m. Uh, and uh, on February the 9th and the 16th, the 6 p.m. Sunday night worship service. And February 20th is the regional missions rally at Stedman Baptist Church in Stedman. Anyone want to say anything about that? And uh, then March 1st, well, I know we're getting on to March, that is WMU Sunday. So we're trying to make some calls, but in the event that we don't have your phone number and don't make a call, all of the women in the church are invited to be a part of that service. We'd love to see you, most of you, feel the sight. So uh, we're going to be getting in contact with you, but if for some reason we don't, and it's an oversight, please come and join us in the choir, and we'll be practicing on Wednesday nights. Um, also, uh, March 1st, before the Trinity View Baptist Church, there's a youth night with supper. Are there any more announcements that need to be made? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when we had Baptist men, there was a few that asked us for copies of uh, the service mm -hmm. that day. And with Brittany here, she is able to make copies for us of any service we have. So at any time, if anybody wants a copy of the service, whatever it may be, uh, we will make that for you and have it. Right now we have some copies for the Baptist men today. I know Jeff Green went on, got it for you. And so if anybody else wants one, come out to us here. We'll get it to you, okay? And it's also Um, for the month of January, our, um, we do foreign missions, we do home missions. The month of January, we did a home <coughs> mission project, and that was to support the um, Living Hope Pregnancy Support Center in Whiteville. And we gave out baby bottles, 30 baby bottles, uh, that you could put your change into, your dollar bills, your checks, whatever you want to put. And we also collected some, some items. We had Janet McPherson from uh, Living Hope come and speak to us. It was very inspiring. So at this time, if you have brought your baby bottles for us to give to Living Hope, please bring those up and put them on this little table right here. so much for bringing this. Let's go to the Lord first. Dear the Lord, thank you for the people who have made the effort to give an offering for living hope. We pray, dear Lord, that this change, these dollars, these clothes will bless a child, bless a mother, and dear Lord, be an opening for us to tell others about you and your saving grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you very much. So that was a great, doesn't that look great? Yeah. Let's give your hand. I told you we do home, this was a home mission project. This is a great local home mission project. In December, you remember Samaritan's Purse, we did the uh, shoe boxes for the kids. And that's an international project. And we uh, uh, packed boxes for children. And uh, we also 
had to send those overseas, and it cost $9 a box. We also had to collect money for, um, for, um, for the postage to, to ship, the shipping. But we want to do, uh, we're going to rotate, and this year in December, we will not be doing the Samaritan Purse shoe boxes. We will be doing a, an outreach in Appalachia. T two reasons. One is that's a home mission project. The second is we can drive that stuff up there. Another church can drive it up, and there's no postage. So you can spend more money buying things and, uh, and giving it to the folks instead of with shipping. Uh, there'll be backpacks, and we're not going to gather it all at one time. What we're going to do is we're going to take alternating months beginning in February and collect items. So in the month of February, we'd like for you to collect some things. This is cold season. It's cold weather season. Things are on sale because we're going into spring. So a toasty pair of gloves, okay? If you can buy a pair of gloves, that would be great. A cozy little scarf, that would be great. And a cool hat, okay? <laughs> if you can bring any of these things, we'll have bins throughout the church to collect, and we will save them for December. In, the, in April, we will be collecting something else, and we'll do that throughout the year. So thank you for the baby bottles, and I look forward to receiving your woolens um, in the month of February. To reconcile to himself all things through his blood shed on the cross, Colossians 1, 20. Join us now as we sing 1, 2, and 4 verses of hymn number 140 down at the cross. <laughs> This morning we're here to observe a very special time. And as you see in your bulletin, I've uh, entitled the message today, not observing communion or participating in union, but in experiencing communion. Because today I hope to draw you into an experience of a communion, first with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, secondly with one another as brothers and sisters, perhaps members of this church, perhaps just worshiping family within this church. And so that will be our focus. And as we just sang, uh, our hymn and now the remainder of what we'll be doing will all be focused and pointing toward this experience of communion.
So I'm going to ask you, because in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that we are to examine ourselves and be prepared to come before this time of communion, to be prepared with a clean heart, with all sins removed. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer, but I'm going to ask of you, is that you, and for just a moment in silence, and I'll have pause for just a moment of silence, we'll be able to pray ourselves, talk to God, ask God to cleanse and refresh and renew us, and prepare our hearts and minds to come to this table and experience communion together. So let us join together in prayer, and will you talk to God and be sure your heart is right and prepared to take communion here this day. Father, our hearts are all turned toward you, and we are very much mindful today that Jesus Christ did hang upon a cross. He rose from the grave, and he proclaimed forgiveness of sins for all who would entrust themselves to him. And Father, as we come to celebrate that today, we come to be reminded that that did not come without a high price, and that also comes with a... Uh, obligation for us to love one another as your family your people so God I pray this morning that as we prepare our hearts our minds our spirits to come and enter into this time of communion that it will be a very special time a time in which your Holy Spirit descends upon us a time in which you affirm that we indeed are your children through Jesus Christ a time when you affirm that we are to love and nurture one another forgiving and overlooking the sins of one another, that we may love and encourage each other in our own journeys and walks with Jesus Christ. So we give this time to you, O oh Lord, and we ask that you will instruct and teach us. We ask that you will inspire us and move our hearts and enable us this day to experience communion and not just do what we often do and then move on. But Lord, let this be a moment of being with you and a moment of reaffirming our commitment to love you, to serve you, to walk faithfully with Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I ask it in his name. Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's Hebrews 9.22. Please stand and join us as we sing the first, third, and fourth verses of hymn number 135, Nothing But the Blood. <laughs>
It is good to be back with you again today. And it is my special joy to be with you today in our time of communion together. As I shared with you, I am entitled our time together this morning, The Experience or Experiencing Communion. And that's not to put down that, well, we haven't before or we don't before, but I know in my own personal perspective, and let me share that with you, that I grew up in a church, a mother and a father who went to church every Sunday, and that was a part of life. And I remember the plate being passed around and the cups being passed around. And even as I grew up and went to school and continued, uh, communion was a particular time in their, all the church life. <coughs> However, what I did find about myself was many times I was just going through the motion. I wasn't experiencing what communion is about. I was instead just taking a piece of bread, drinking a cup, and saying, yes, praise the Lord, thank the Lord, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'm okay now. But that's not what communion is. You see, communion is a much deeper spiritual experience where you and I are called to reaffirm a faith and trust in Jesus Christ, a faith and trust that's visible in our daily decision-making, our daily choices, our daily activities, our daily conversation. We are in faith, trusting in Jesus Christ, living in obedience to Jesus Christ, but we are also living in community with one another, hence the word communion, a community of people. And we are reaffirming that we are all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And God loves all his family. And God wants all his family to work together in harmony and unity together. And that takes a lot of work. It doesn't just happen. This morning as you and I talk about communion, we call it by different names. You've probably heard it used by different names, what communion, and we refer to it as the Lord's Supper. Many times that kind of a familiar phrase. If you're in a more formal church, you may even hear it being called or referred to as the Eucharist. And uh, that's a little more formal term for the observing of the Lord's Supper. Or, as I've already mentioned, the word communion. Because communion gives an idea and a perception of being brought together. And therefore... Observing the Lord's Supper is not particularly something we should do independent and separately, but it's something we do within ourselves as a community and family because God has made us his family. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, again, I refer to the Apostle Paul speaking to we are the body of Jesus Christ, and we're all part of that body. No one's left out. No one's excluded. We're all a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Communion means to be in fellowship, as I mentioned, both with Christ and also with brothers and sisters, not just within the church, but within the world. We are family in Jesus Christ. However, maintaining fellowship, maintaining the communion of being together comes at a heavy price sometimes. Renewing fellowship, just being in connected together comes at a heavy enough price, but you see, renewing our fellowship requires forgiveness. Jesus talked about forgiving. Peter asked Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive that old knothead over there that doesn't want to do like I want him to do? And Jesus says, unlimited. When you stop wanting to forgive, you've already stopped loving. And Jesus says you're to love. You're to love your brother, your sister. And sometimes they irritate. Sometimes they get on your nerves. Sometimes they just have a way. But many times we do ourselves. And if we're going to maintain communion, if we're going to maintain fellowship with one another, then it comes at the cost of forgiveness. You see, all that's seen in the life of Jesus Christ. And too often what happens is we come to the Lord's Supper, the table, if you will, and our intent is that we reaffirm our faith with Jesus Christ, his forgiveness of us, and our confidence that we're going to go to heaven, and we drop it at that. But communion goes far further than that. It requires of you and I that we practice forgiveness and re the renewing of fellowship between you and I as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Christ is at the basis, however it spreads. 
for you and I as we live each day. Today, you and I are renewing our fellowship with God. That's my joy as a minister of the gospel, to be able to lead you in observing communion. And as you take that bread and you symbolize, the, uh, take the symbol of Jesus' broken body for you and I because of our sin, because of our brokenness within this world, we also will take a cup of juice. And that cup will remind us that the new covenant made with God is no longer the covenant of the Jews and the sacrificial system. But Jesus now paid the sacrifice. Jesus paid the cost so that you and I could be reconnected with God, reunited with him. I'm going to ask at this time, as we enter into a very holy and special time, I'm going to ask that the uh, deacons come forward and that those who've been chosen to remove the covering from the Lord's table and the elements will come now and do so. And then if you'll remain seated up front, we will then uh, walk into this time that I hope will be a little different but more meaningful to you in experiencing communion. Let's join together in prayer. Father, as we now move into the more solemn moment of experiencing communion together, I pray that you will move upon our hearts, that you will prepare us, that you will bring to our mind any sin, anything for which we need your forgiveness, anything for which we need to ask forgiveness from a brother or sister. And God, that you will then prepare our hearts so that we may enter into communion with a pure heart, and with an anticipation of experiencing you here in this place, in this very moment. God, I pray that you will put your hand of blessing upon both the bread and the juice, that it will not be for us simply that that is so familiar and of which we eat and drink, but it will be that which has a powerful spiritual representation to us, that we may recognize he who gave himself so that we might belong to you. So, Father, now come and move among us and let your hand of blessing be upon this time. And this we ask in Jesus, our Lord's name. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. I encourage you to follow along with me. I think they will have it on the screen. But follow along with me as I read for you out of the New International Version. Luke, chapter 22, beginning with verse 14 through 20. And this, of course, comes out of Jesus' last night with his disciples. As he met with his disciples, we see that in uh, verse, or chapter 22 of Luke, Jesus assembles them into a room, and they observe the Passover meal. I want you to understand that today the Passover meal is in the background of what we're doing. In other words, the Lord's Supper grows literally out of the Passover meal. But many times you and I will not grasp some of the really uh, significant elements of the Lord's Supper because we really have just disconnected and not taken time to learn what the Passover meal is or what it's all about. And so I'll be sharing just a little bit about that, but walking with you through this today. Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As we look into this passage, you and I are well familiar with the reality that Jesus is about to go through the cross, to go through the persecution, go through the beatings, all that he goes through till literally life is removed from his body, his earthly body, and he's placed in a tomb. And then the Easter story and message that three days later he rose from the grave. Here Jesus is meeting with his disciples. And what he's doing on this last night is it's timed because Jesus wanted this last night to be the night of the Passover meal. You see, the Passover meal grew out of the Israelites being freed from Egypt. Many of you can remember how that whenever they were in Egypt, they went through the plagues, and the final plague was that the firstborn of everything and everyone would be killed by the death angel. The way in which the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, were to avoid that was that they were to kill a sacrificial lamb, smear the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and then eat that for their meal that night and eat it in haste because they were not aware Moses tried to tell them, the next day you're leaving town. The next day they're going to send you out. And so eat, ready to prepare to leave. That meal grew into, or experience grew into a meal that's been observed for centuries on end. And the Jewish people as they gather, and today they are many that are referred to as Messianic Jews. The Old Testament talks about the coming Messiah. Messianic Jews basically are those who are Hebrew, those who come out of the Jewish uh, ethnic people, and they have come to understand that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the prophets spoke of. He is the Messiah. As Paul the Apostle, I'm reading right now in my daily devotions in the book of Acts, and Paul, as he goes from place to place, talks to them about the Messiah you're looking forward to is already here. He is Jesus, the Christ. And so the Messianic meal is referred is that of coming together and remembering where we've come from and where we're going and in between how we transition, how that's to take place. So in the meal that uh, is referred to as the Passover meal, there would have been four cups of wine that they would have drunk at specific times to represent specific things. The first was taken to remember the sanctification of God's people. God sanctified you. God chose you. God named you and called you his own. He set you apart, as we find in many places in the Old Testament, to be a very different, peculiar people because we belong to him. God has sanctified us, set us apart, made us holy. The second cup that's taken is the cup of deliverance. God delivered the Israelites, the Jews, from the Egyptians. God, through that last night of killing all the firstborn of the flocks, the herds, and even the people, finally Pharaoh says, Moses, take your people and get out of here. God delivered them from the, Israel, or from the Egyptians. Not only God also took them through the Red Sea, God took them through the wilderness, God delivered them from their slavery and their bondage to Egypt. The third cup is the cup of redemption. God redeemed them. That's the whole sacrificial system. 
You have broken your fellowship with me. You have not followed and walked along in fellowship and communion with me. So how was God to correct that error? He used the lambs, the uh, cattle, different sacrifices that came depending on what the situation was. And they were offered, and interestingly, you may not know, is that when those uh, uh, sacrifices for their sins were being offered, the part of the worshiper was to lay their hands upon that sacrifice prior to its being killed and pass on their sin and their guilt so God would remove it. And God cleansed the hearts. You see, the picture in the Passover meal is that we have been set apart to belong to God. We have been delivered and removed from our sins <coughs> delivered from all that has taken its hold and grip upon us because of God's love and grace. And we have been redeemed, bought back in essence, bought back from God, for God, from Satan, from all the things in our world that have laid claim and hold upon us. And the last is the cup of praise. We celebrate God's good gifts. God's goodness, God's sanctifying us, God's delivering of us, God's redeeming of us. We worship and honor him in so doing. Now, Jesus is at the Last Supper, his last meal, other than, remember, after he rose from the grave, he had some fish one morning for breakfast with the disciples. But Jesus identifies this as the last actual meal that he shares, and it is the Passover meal which included a time of eating in the midst of that. Jesus gives to them a promise, and Luke brings this out, whereas the other Gospels kind of skip over that one and move on. But you see, in Luke's Gospel, we see that the Last Supper began with a cup. Most of us thought it was just two cups. We had the cup of the, the uh, bread that's taken, as we understand it, and then the cup of juice. But in the Passover, as I mentioned, there were four cups, four things they were remembering. So Jesus passed around a cup, evidently the cup of sanctification, many believe. That first cup, you have been made God's people. God has put his name on you. God's chosen you. You see, it was in that cup that Jesus passed around. And Jesus, as we just read in that passage of Scripture, says the next time that we eat, we're going to be eating in God's kingdom. It will have come. It is here. And God is anticipating. Christ is helping the disciples anticipate what's about to take place. The cup of promise, if you will. The kingdom comes, however, at a heavy price. I tried to emphasize for you the little word before. Jesus says, I have so greatly wanted to sit down and have this meal before I suffer. And they had no idea what he was about to go through. All of them were stargazers, and they were looking at, man, he's going to set up the kingdom, and we're going to be in the White House, and we're going to be the cabinet, and this place is going to be over the whole world, and man, we just can't wait. And they had no earthly idea. The very next day, they would all be hiding in fear. And Jesus would be hanging on a cross. Jesus said to his disciples when they first gathered together, men, he said, I'm giving you a promise. The kingdom of God is on its way, and it's almost here. And when we eat, the next time I share a meal with you, it will be in the kingdom of God. It will have come. Jesus also then next symbolizes the cost he is paying in order for them to be a part of God's community, God's people, God's family. Jesus said to his disciples as we move down toward the end, he goes through the first cup and says in verse 19, and he, Jesus, took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What is the cost for your and my forgiveness? What is the cost for your and my 
being redeemed and brought back into a right relationship with God, it was literally the broken body, the beatings, all that Jesus went through. It was his suffering for you and I. So when you and I today take a little piece of bread and we eat that bread, we're not just doing a religious act. You and I are recognizing, Jesus, you suffered for me. And I am greatly indebted to you for your gift of forgiveness upon my life. I forgot to do something before I came up today. I didn't see any children. You've got something going on with the children. And uh, let me grab this. <coughs> what I wanted to do at this point is in the Passover meal, the before the meal starts, the leader of the meal would uh, give some uh, bread, the matzah bread, the bread without yeast, and to give it to a child and say, go hide it. And then when he gets to this point, when before they drink that cup, he would ask, who has taken the matzah bread? And ask that child to bring the bread back. And sometimes I will give to a, some young person in the church uh, my hat. I'll say, whenever we come in, I say, how about go take my hat and go hide it somewhere. And then at that time, we got a couple over there. Yeah, and uh, they will bring my hat to me. And then I would say, okay, I kind of like my hat. And you've got it. It's now your hat. Can I buy it back? I'll give you three, four, five dollars, whatever it is, if you will let me have my hat back. Not really let me, but I'll buy it. I'll give you the five dollars, take my hat. Redemption. You and I are redeemed. You see, that's the image that in the Passover meal you, we are to see is that we are being redeemed, bought back by God. Jesus is taking us from Satan. He's taking us from captivity. He's taking us from the world. And Jesus is purchasing you and I to be his people. Hence the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know you were bought with a price? Therefore glorify God with your body. At this time I'm going to ask the deacons if they will. I'll pass out the plates to them. They will pass them out to you. And as we do so, let us remember you and I are redeemed by the broken body of Jesus Christ. You and I have been bought back. We now belong to God once again. Will we be God's? Will we love God and serve him? Will we recognize the indebtedness which we have?
we have just read it was the night of the, the last supper of Jesus' disciples and a meal that was so familiar to them so they understood so well Jesus all of a sudden changed things and he passed around the bread the matzah bread unleavened bread and he says from henceforth eat this in remembrance of me for this is my body that has redeemed you and brought you back with God's eternal possession love him Father, thank you that in our own brokenness and in that which we have caused to ourselves, you came to us, you gave your life for us, and then you made us your own people. Thank you for the redemption that you alone could provide and you so willingly gave. Help us to live. After Jesus passed the bread and they broke the bread, which seems to have been during that time of redemption, then Jesus passed around a cup. And you see, this time the cup was no longer referring to what God did in the life of the Hebrews in Egypt and brought them into the promised land. But now this cup is referring to that which God has done through Jesus Christ to you and I, to all the world whoever will come and entrust themselves to Jesus Christ. Jesus symbolized the source of their hope. What source? What, where do you get the hope for each and every day? He passed around the cup, and he says, there is now a new covenant being made with the Father. You need not bring a lamb, goat, bull, whatever it may be. Now there is one who has died, the perfect sacrifice and he's died so that you might be forgiven you have hope through Jesus Christ he would be a new covenant with God Jesus making that covenant he also Jesus provides the source of our hope we look to him it's not in what I can do what I can achieve or I can accomplish it's what Jesus Christ has done and he is my source of hope he is that which gives me confidence of spending eternity with God the Father. He is that which gives me courage to face each day. He is that which enables me to look at life and say, yeah, I can see, and Satan will bring out all the bad things, but I know he who forgives and he who removes, and I give him thanks. Jesus, it says in verse 20, in the same way, like that of the bread that he passed around. After the supper he took, after they ate, not the conclusion of the Passover meal, but the, or the Passover experience, but at the end of that time of eating together, he passed around the cup, and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, and when he bled, and when they thrust the sword or the spear in his side and out flowed blood and water, Jesus was giving that. It was not being taken from him. He was not being removed of earthly life by the power and the source of humanity. I love that old hymn. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. He had the power, the authority. But why did he put it all aside? Because God wanted you and I who have been lost, you and I who have been stolen, you and I who have been removed from him by our world to be redeemed and brought back into fellowship with him and then to live with a hope not based upon our ability but upon God's love and God's mercy. He passed the cup. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget what I've done. 
Don't forget your source of hope. Don't lose track. But be reminded, this cup is the cup of a new covenant. And because of me, you indeed are brought in relationship, fellowship, communion with the Father. and passed around the bread and said, remember the human being. You've been sanctified through the Father, through his work, but you have been lost by your teaching and your meaning and your meaning that says you've been redeemed. The Father has brought back, bought back Lewis, his children. Not only that, but then he passed the cup and he says the way in which you are brought into a relationship with your Father not by anything of your own. It is by the gift that I give to you. By my blood that's shed upon the cross, upon the street where he was whipped and beaten, where it was shed by the spear, I give my blood so that I, the eternal sacrifice, might bring you into fellowship. With the Father and with one another. Drink, remember Jesus Christ. not left to ourselves. And 
thank you that we need not continue the sacrificial system of animals, but now there is only one who can sacrifice and you need only to be sacrificed. And that is you yourself in the form of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we gather to worship here this day. Thank you that we're able to leave with confidence of being in your presence throughout all eternity because you have given to us a new covenant and we are bound by that covenant together. So let us, Lord, live in honor and in devotion to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask the deacons who will cover the table and we will involve you. If you have your Bibles, you can look in Luke 22 at verses 28, 29, and 30. I want to conclude by pointing you to the realization that Jesus gave them one final reminder. He says, here's one last thing I want to leave with you, and I want you to keep upon your mind. Beginning in verse uh, 28, Jesus says, you are those who have stood by me in my life trials, and I confer, place upon you, give unto you a kingdom just as my Father conferred one upon me, so that you may eat and drink at, the, uh, at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus left with those who have participated in this meal which you and I have observed here this day. Just one last promise. He says, you are now given upon your shoulders my kingdom. You are the kingdom of God. We are to represent, we are to share, we are to love and nurture, and we are to sustain a communion with one another that says to the world, we truly are God's kingdom people. And we will live under his rule and under his authority. May God grant that you and I be able to do just that by living and following and honoring Jesus Christ our Lord and loving one another and enjoying the joy of the communion of the saints and our fellowship with God Almighty now and forever. To his name be honor and glory. Amen. This time we'll have our benediction. Someone is supposed to come and That they may be one as we are. It comes from John chapter 17, verse 11. Please stand as we sing all four verses of hymn number 387. Blessed be the time. <coughs> my first time, guys. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Go on. <laughs> <laughs>